This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Well, welcome to Atkinson Hall. Uh, I've been asked to make a few opening remarks. I will interpret that broadly and start by sharing an observation. As I was listening in to the conversations earlier today, uh, it dawned on me that if you look around uh, the universities in the US, uh, practically every one of them has a computer science department, and they train hundreds of students every year in software engineering. And lots of them look for cool ideas, projects to do, and out of the thousands and thousands of students emerge a few uh, 100, perhaps, that are trying to create new companies, and then out pops a Twitter or a Facebook or a Google. So I think universities have a huge role to play in building this massive pyramid out of which uh, these breakout ideas emerge. I was also noting with a tinge of uh, uh, sadness, really, that this does not extend to other disciplines uh, like power engineering. When I was an undergraduate, uh, you know, power engineering was just almost as important and as popular as what was called electronics engineering, right, where we studied chips and communications and so on. There are very few universities left in the world where they teach power engineering, you know. Who really knows today what a series motor is, uh, what an induction motor is? And then we hear that 40%, 50% of all the energy consumed runs through a motor. So I think uh, much as we look for efficient ways of innovating, we must recognize that many of these innovations spring out of universities that actually spend and educate very large numbers of people in the foundational material, a lot of which you can construct these things. So uh, UCSD is trying to do something about it. Not enough, I personally think. I think we are hiring six faculty members uh, specifically focused this year on energy. But I think a lot more needs uh, to happen. So that's uh, my little rant. Uh, uh, <laughs> So welcome again to Atkinson Hall. Uh, you heard from Larry Smar. You know, we uh, uh, have him as institute director. This is the San Diego division of Cal IT2 that you're at. There is a division at Irvine. And Larry very lovingly uh, calls Cal IT2 as uh, a cancerous growth uh, on campus. I like to at least think that we are a very benign cancerous growth here. We are truly an out-of-the-box environment. We work with uh, 23 departments uh, at UCSD. I've been here for a very long time, and I didn't know we had that many departments. And I'm pleased to learn that I believe there are only 25 departments. So we work with practically all departments on this campus. And what makes it attractive for people to come here is partly what you will witness, experience yourself later tonight uh, when we have some tours for you. Uh, so there's really very few people who are forced to work with Cal IT2, and we, and we are not forced to work with anybody. So it's sort of like the outcome of the engagement. So the fact that we have 800 people in the building, done close to a, a billion dollars worth of research uh, since our founding 10 years ago, is a testament to the energy that is there in this campus with a focus on faculty excellence and our ability to respond to that. And so uh, rather than talk more, I think uh, I will invite you to stay and experience and witness. And I will tell you, it's amazing how many important new initiatives and relationships were developed when people wandered in here on one pretext or another. So I hope out of today's conversations will emerge some long-lived relationships. So welcome again. Thank you. Hello, I'm Alexis Madrigal. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic, uh, where I cover technology. I saw many of you uh, earlier today. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you Will Wright, uh, who uh, is probably the most famous person I've ever interviewed. Uh, <laughs> I don't believe that. He is responsible for the game uh, The Sims, which is the best-selling PC game of all time. Uh, but more importantly, he really created an entire new category of game, a game that really didn't matter if you won or lost. What really mattered was truly how you played the game, how you built cities, 
how you built uh, communities. Um, he went on from that to create a game called Spore, uh, which probably is the closest you'll ever come to being God, uh, if you've ever played. You get to move up from uh, single cell life forms all the way to uh, creatures in, in tribes uh, to running around space. Um, it's one of the most ambitious games, probably the most ambitious game uh, that's ever been attempted um, and was also an incredible success. Um, I want to tell you just a little, a little story, a uh, San Diego story. I, I left my hotel earlier to go for a quick run to kind of clear my head. Uh, and I went and I ran down uh, by, by the beach. And as I was running, um, I, I was thinking a lot about my, my conversation with Will and what I was going to do. And I, and I looked out and I saw like immediately this incredible dolphin come out of the ocean do a 360 <laughs> and splash back down. And I thought, that's my first theme, fun. <laughs> then, from then on, I could not stop staring at the ocean. From that, all my visual range now, I wanted to refilter what I was seeing to be the ocean. And so that's the second theme, filters. How when you see it, that something can work in the world or in a virtual world, it can change the way that you start to see that world. And the last thing is, as I was staring out looking for dolphins, I hit a, a, a patch and fell onto my face. And so the third theme of tonight sure. Great. is failure. Um, so I wanna, I wanna start there, Will. Um, you, you have said in the past, from one of your interviews, some of the most effective education is failure-based, where you're given a system and you can manipulate it and explore different failure states and success states. Um, what do you see as an effective way of bringing the idea of failure-based education into a, a system that has been entirely resistant to it? Well, I think games are kind of unique in the fact that, in some sense, they celebrate failure. Uh, you know, with any game, there's this interaction loop the player is going through. They pick up the controller, they start pressing buttons, and at first you don't know how to control Mario, and you figure out that makes him jump, that makes him go forward. That's the very first interaction loop. It's occurring over a few seconds. There's success and failure on both sides of that. You know, initially I'm failing to control them, then I learn to control them. Then I start moving along and I encounter some obstacles, you know, bosses, you know, trenches, uh, locked doors, whatever. Uh, that's the next level. That's occurring over maybe minutes, you know, and there are successes and failures on both sides of that as well. Most people, when they play games, most of what they're experiencing in the game is failure, uh, and they enjoy it. You know, what you actually need to do in a game is have a diversity of failure, have people understand why they're failing, so then they want to go back. That's the compulsion. Is it, oh, I see, I need to do this to get the key to open the door. And that is the motivation to have them go into the next loop, you know. And it's that failure-based learning really is, you know, in some sense, almost uh, the kernel of the scientific method. That if you look at a little kid playing a game, they have no idea, they don't read the instructions, they pick up the controller, they start, you know, just, you know, experimenting, basically. Observing the results, start building a hypothesis in their mind, totally based upon the failures and then later the successes that they encounter. But uh, in a game, you know, that's really what play is about. You know, play is really kind of exploring the boundaries of a system. You know, where can I push this system? What's its range of behavior? And that's, you know, in some sense, you know, the word play. Uh, and I think that, you know, when you kind of go in with that mindset that I'm going to play with this, you know, and I am not necessarily have to achieve this goal, but I want to kind of see what the system can do, uh, then the failures, you know, don't feel like failures. They feel like exploration. Right. And you've called that, right, the possibility space, like what you find by failure in the game. That's what you can, defines what you can do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the possibility space encompasses both failure and solutions. Um, you know, any game really, in some sense, is a problem. You know, we're actually selling the, you know, the player a problem for $30 or whatever they're paying for it. Hopefully it's a very interesting problem with a variety of solutions. And the player is exploring kind of the, uh, initially the failure space, looking for the solution space. But uh, it's interesting, like anybody who plays a game, within a few minutes they get a sense of the possibility space of that game. Whether it's on rails and it's pretty much a choose your own adventure, or whether it's a more open-ended simulation like, you know, something like The Sims. Uh, they intuit that. They intuit the, the space, the possibility space encompassed in that system. All right, you have kids. Did you try and, how, how did you build into your own family education the idea that failure was okay? 
and in fact a necessary component. I have two kids very far apart. My daughter, I was inflicting my games on from a very early age, you know. <laughs> and you know, growing up with a you know, game designer of her father, you know, probably warps you in a certain way. Uh, but, you know, I always uh, found that with her, she would like find some certain aspect of the game that she really wanted to go off in some direction that totally took me by surprise. And um, I have actually a year and a half year old now, a boy, Parker. And I gave him an iPad, I don't know, six months ago, and I didn't even tell him what to do with it. I, you know, I just put it on the floor next to him. And within about two months, he figured it out on his own without me doing a thing. He knows how to power it up, slide the thing to unlock it, go through <laughs> the screens, find the app he wants, boot up the app, you know, has his favorite apps. And I, I just sat back in awe, you know, watching this kid do this, you know, entirely. And I watched him fail a lot, but, um, he, you know, over time, he kind of, uh, figured out that, you know, he failed 10 times, but then he succeeded. And then he failed 10 times, succeeded. And, you know, this is instinctual to us, you know, to everybody. You know, kids come into this world knowing how to do that. And that's their mode of learning about the world. You know, it's later that we learn about things like storytelling. You know, those are kind of learned constructs, I think, compared to direct interactivity. Huh, that's interesting. I mean, when you see, like, how, how do you, you've got now a kid who's got an iPad mm -hmm. uh, and is, is learning how to manipulate it. I mean, I think a lot of parents, at least the parents that I've talked to, are worried about the sort of impact that staring at a screen for a lot of hours a day can have on their kid. I mean, how do you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, you can say that about anything. And you know, I think that is an issue. There was a passage I read a few years ago that was really remarkable. It was a guy, walk, he walked into a room and he saw this person sitting in the corner with this device. And they were so totally absorbed in this device, they didn't even notice him walk in the room. You know, and you know, the person was kind of writing how creeped out he was. This person, it's like he wasn't even there. He was possessed. What was wrong with him? This passage was actually written in the 14th century. <laughs> and it was the first time you'd seen somebody reading a book. Right. And it right. was, you know, a monk in the corner reading a book, you know. Uh, and the idea that um, an artifact like that can displace us so thoroughly, uh, especially if you don't understand the artifact and you don't understand the power of that, uh, you know, can be very off-putting. And, you know, there are, you know, you can overdo anything. But in some sense, you know, games and books and movies and, you know, all of media, what it's doing is it's leveraging the human imagination, which is possibly the most, you know, kind of defining aspect of being human, that we can build these imaginary worlds, we can imagine these things and, you know, kind of uh, live whole lives in these things that inform our regular life. You know, we learn from these. Yeah. You know, I read a, a beautiful thing you, you once said that you don't realize how complex a human hand is until you try and model one. Yeah. Um, and you, you also said in an different interview um, that you always have been really attracted to trying to model human beings, and that's sort of um, part of what generated your desire to, to make The Sims. Mm. And I wonder, like, what did you learn uh, about human beings by creating The Sims, and, and what came after? I learned that they're very easy to model from a distance, and uh, almost impossible close up. Uh, you know, when I was modeling The Sims, I actually started thinking, you know, what could we actually effectively model on a computer that looked pretty believable and plausible? And, you know, I pretty much got to like the second floor balcony perspective, which is that if you're standing on the second floor balcony looking down at people on the street, uh, you know, they might be window shopping, they might be stalking, you know, talking, you can't really hear what they're saying, but you can tell that they're maybe arguing or flirting or whatever. That was about the level that I think, you know, we were able to simulate them in The Sims, which is kind of what we did, you know. In The Sims, one of the things they, you do not hear is you do not hear their speech. They right. speak in this kind of... You Simlish. Know, Simlish, yeah. You, you know what we're talking about? It's like... <laughs> <You're> like <laughs> right. You know, but... Uh, like meaningless phonemes, basically. Like well, it's not together. entirely meaningless because you can actually tell the emotional tone. In fact, we have a, a wide range of emotional tones. I can tell if they're upset, if they're tired, you know, but I just can't tell what the actual topic is. What we found, and we find this in games a lot, that um, really when we're simulating these systems, we're dealing with two processors. You know, one is inside the computer, the other is inside the player's head. There's certain things that we can simulate very effectively on the computer, and other things that just suck if you try to simulate them on the computer. But those things that uh, suck on the computer, generally, you can simulate very well in the player's imagination. Um, and so by leaving the conversation in kind of the simlish, we were leaving the players to basically imagine what they were saying, and they would fill in the blanks very effectively. You know, uh, The Sims was really effective at kind of creating online communities out of sort of the trade of virtual items. People would create new, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, create new types of objects that could be placed into other worlds. So you, I, it's pretty clear you've been following social media space for a while. I wonder, how do you view Facebook and, and Twitter as games? 
I mean, do you think of them that way? Do you think that they can be played in a conventional sense? Well, obviously, there are a lot of games on Facebook, but you mean the activity of just kind of updating your Facebook Right, right, page I don't mean Farmville. I mean yeah. just sort of like, you know, going through photos or right. tagging things or uploading. Well, I think there's a very important aspect that games have uh, been learning over the years and been trending more towards, which is that um, you never go wrong overestimating the narcissism of the player. Uh, <laughs> and so the more you can center the experience and make it about me, uh, the more I'm going to be into it, right? You know, right, oh, right. it's about me. It's fascinating. Oh, yeah. yeah and I want to yeah. share it with all my friends. Look right, what I did. The classic you know. spam that's like, I found this funny picture of you. You click on it and yeah, you got a virus. Yeah, of course. Right. Uh, but, you know, and that's what Facebook is all about, really. You know, it's basically a personal newspaper that's all about you. Uh, and your friends, and you know, as things get further away from your interests, they kind of fade away into smaller and smaller type in Facebook. But um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I think the gist of it, though, is the fact that um, we have this whole generation growing up. They call the you know the millennials, and they expect the world to conform to them. They're, they don't expect that they're going to have to conform to the world. You know, and even when you get into products and services and all that, they expect these things to be customized. They expect you know, a technology to understand them. Um, and I, that's, you know, it's interesting because I think that is where technology is going, you know, that, uh, you know, all of our technology really has been a leverage for us. You know, you can understand any form of human technology as an extension of our body. You know, cars extend our feet, a telephone extends our, you know, our voice. Uh, computers extend a lot of these things, but more importantly, I think they extend our imagination. And so I think that you know, computer games, one of the things that's interesting is that people for the first time were able to kind of not only imagine these elaborate worlds, but then instantiate them and share them with somebody else. Yeah. It used to be that you know, if you were a really good writer or a, you know, a master artist, you, know, you had that ability to imagine a world and then somehow you know, kind of convey it to somebody else. Now the average person has that ability. And not only the ability to convey that, but to share an imaginary world with somebody else and build it up as a collective you know, kind of uh, consensus. If you were designing The Sims, like for the millennials specifically, for a group of people that expects the world to conform to them, mm -hmm. like how would you change it? Would it would it be the same game, or would it be? It would be pretty similar because I, you know, very early on with early versions of The Sims, the very first thing I noticed is that everybody wanted to put themselves in the game, and you know, at different age ranges they would kind of do different things. Uh, teenagers, you know, teenage girls was like the the peak of the demographic for The Sims. You know, fourteen or maybe thirteen year old girls, and they would put themselves in the game, and then they would put their boyfriend in the game, and observe what happened, you know. And then they would later go back and tell their boyfriend, "Guess what you did in the game," you know. And you know, I, I think it was some kind of cathartic, weird, psycho, analytic thing for them, you know. Right. But uh, but again, you know, the idea that the game was about them uh, seemed appropriate. You know, they wanted a game about them. They didn't want a game about you know the Battle of the Bulge. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that one was for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, there. In, in the game Spore, uh, for those who aren't familiar, you can create creatures, and they look different, uh, different types, sorts of creatures. And then you can upload them, and they get sort of distributed automatically, but mostly automatically, to other people's uh, game universes. And this was sort of, they were calling it a massively single player game. That is to say that there were all these people who were kind of uh, connected through the creatures that they were creating and uploading. Mm -hmm. um, well, now something like more than 100 million, I don't know what the, the most recent number is, but more than 100 million of objects have been uploaded. Um, we hit that number in about three months. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. And so I'm just like wondering, you know, what do you learn about what people like about other people's artistic creations? Because like fundamentally what you're doing is you're creating a little piece of art that happens to be uh, a, a, a creature in a game, and then you're saying, go out in the world and do something. Um, do you find that there are artisans of creatures who turn out to be really good at creating these things for other people? Or is everybody fundamentally just about as good at making Oh, no, creatures? there's a definite kind of a logarithmic curve, you know, where, you know, any kind of system like that, 90% of the stuff basically kind of sucks. 10% um, <laughs> of it, though, is really good. Uh, and uh, it was, first of all, the, the volume was remarkable, you know, because we actually created a lot of creatures for the game before we released the game. We had our artists creating them, and they were using the same tool that the players were using. And, you know, our artists would make about uh, two or three a week. Um, you know, within the first day of release, we passed a million that the players had made. Uh, which, you know, the, and they were extraordinarily good, you know, at least 100,000 of them. Right. You know, but still, <laughs> compared to what we were making, you know, it was a drop in the ocean. But, um, yeah, we find that there are not only people that are good at this, but there are certain people that did not expect to be good at this that are, 
And then all it takes is maybe five or six people giving them positive encouragement because we had you know, social feedback features in here too. So if I saw a creature in, you know, on a planet in the world, I could find out who made it and leave a note saying, oh, I love your creature, or his eyes are so cute, or whatever it was. <laughs> um, but only a few people saying that was cool gives them an intense motivation. Nobody's ever told them they're creative before. And all of a sudden, for the first time, they have absolute strangers telling them they like something that they created. And then they'll spend 100 hours working on the next one. I mean, uh, we saw this in The Sims as well. Um, people would actually uh, make stories and little movies in The Sims. And some of them were extraordinary. You know, at first they were just kind of like stupid superhero type little stories. But later, uh, some of them became these very touching, you know, stories about uh, one woman told a story about how she got out of an abusive relationship. And you could tell the way she was conveying the story that she was just hoping somebody could learn from it. And she felt like she finally had a format in which she could express this. You know, she didn't think of herself as a writer or anything, you know, or putting up a web page. But uh, so I think it's interesting when people discover that they have um, creativity inside them, but more importantly, that they have something to say to the world and that people actually out there will listen to them. You know, your games uh, sort of famously arise or at least are influenced by, you know, books and theories like other things out in the sort of cultural space. Um, so I'm wondering, I know you told me you weren't going to tell me exactly what you're working on now. So what are you reading? What are you... What are oh, you what am I reading? Oh, man. oh, that would just confuse you. <laughs> um, I'm very interested in mapping. Uh, you know, and this is back to old books that I've read before, Edward Tufte, mm -hmm. Richard Saul Worman, uh, all these, you know, information uh, architects, basically. Um, I'm really curious about, you know, the idea of metaphorically mapping things that we don't typically put on maps, uh, like our media collections, uh, our autobiographies. Um, that's kind of part of the direction that I'm just kind of researching. What is it about making things spatial that you think is creative? Well, it that? really comes down to lo organizing large amounts of content because, you know, more and more we have uh, more of our lives up on the web, in the cloud. Uh, I, a while back I estimated, like my grandparents, how much data do they generate in their life that still persists today um, that I have access to? So like photos, diaries? Well, as far as my great-grandparents, not even photos, really, right, right. maybe a couple, you know, but really, you know, it came down to a few hundred, you know, kilobytes, you know, maybe. Um, my grandparents, maybe uh, a bit more. My parents, it was in the megabytes. Um, when I think about my lifespan, I'm probably going to generate terabytes of information easily uh, that will be passed on to my children. Um, so every generation, we're generating kind of more data, but it's also persisting longer. It used to be it was on the form of paper that would be burned in you know, fires or crumble in time and turn into dust. But now it's going on the cloud and potentially this stuff can be backed up pretty easily but also persist you know, so that my great great grandkids will have access to my entire email on Gmail if I decide to leave yeah, it to them. Right. And so I began thinking, you know, everything is moving up there. Our photos, our movies, our correspondence, you know, and well, how would I, do I really want to see my life? You know, what kind of system can I envision where I can now kind of wrap my arms around all the data that I've left, you know, that's an artifact of my existence? Um, you know what I really love about that, too, because I, I feel like right now, st class, stuff that's in the cloud, mm -hmm. data, you essentially have to depend on computer filters. Right. And essentially, if you can visualize it, then we can use just the normal filters that human beings already it's so, have. It's so intangible, in. yeah. Right. And something about digital data it just feels so intangible. And I think that having this sense that you can actually grab it and touch it and manipulate it, um, remix it, do whatever, uh, gives you an emotional connection to it that you don't have when it's just you know, a bunch of files on a computer disk. Um, I want to open it up to questions. I'm sure tons of people would like to ask uh, Will something. We've got it. How about right there? Hi, Dr. Rao here talked about the importance of the university and in innovation, and you talked about the importance of play in fostering innovation. So how do we bring those two worlds together? And I also wonder if there's maybe a role for this positive social feedback that you're talking about and bringing that into the university in the classroom. Yeah, I think, you know, let me start with the last question first. Um, you know, we kind of have this model of broadcast learning, you know, which is the teacher, you know, teacher stands up, gives a lecture, and everybody sits and listens. Um, I think that, you know, recently you've seen things like the Maker Fair kind of dynamic, you know, which are these kind of grassroots organized, community-based creative things, which encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning. I think that there's probably some interesting combination of the two, you know. And a lot of uh, schools, in fact, kind of, you know, go down project-based learning with small teams. Um, and I think that that's uh, uh, probably a step in that direction. 
back to the kind of play question, um, you know, I don't think there's one answer to that. You know, I think the answer is just try anything and learn from the results. You know, play is really about taking risks. It's about exploring. And so um, the more we can kind of, first of all, see the walls around us and the structures and the norms that we always, you know, kind of act uh, underneath, uh, as soon as we see them, we can start moving them around and saying, well, what if we have class outside? What if we have class over here in a different structure? What if we break up the class in different sections and they go back and instruct each other? Um, it's, I think, not being afraid to experiment. Uh, that's, of course, a little bit resistant to standardized testing and measured progress, metered progress. Um, and so I spend a lot of time you know, talking to educators more at the K-12 level. And uh, it's, it's such a, a bottleneck, you know, just kind of dealing with the established procedure of education the way it is in our country today. Um, and when you look at kids that are just really excited about something, and how they pretty much have to do it on their own or outside of school for the most part to kind of really pursue their passions at that level. And I'm, you know, I'm not talking, there are a lot of really innovative programs out there, but in general across the entire country, it's still very much kind of a factory model. But uh, I think we're starting to see that change a little bit. Um, you know, we're starting to see a generation of teachers come into the classroom that grew up with games that maybe are a little bit more open to things like that. And we're starting to see some programs where people are actually being challenged to create educational games that you know teach very specific things. So I think it's just it's a time function. You know that's uh, unfortunately one of the aspects of our civilization that's going to take longer to change than others. Thank you. Uh, Will, last last question for me. Um, what's the favorite What's the favorite thing that you've built? Like, what's your favorite of all the stuff that you've made? Robots, games. That I've built. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh. I mean, is it The Sims? Mm. No. <laughs> uh, actually, I'd say Spore was my favorite, because, and it wasn't because of what I built, because it was the tremendous amount of creativity that came back from the players. Uh, when I browse these hundred million, you know, well over a hundred million things that players have made, you know, uh, in comparison, Earth has like five million species that we know of. So it's an extraordinary number. But uh, just understanding that it's unleashed that much creativity in other people, um, so it's a leverage, you know, an amplification of creativity out in the world. Uh, that would be why. Well, right. Yeah.